Hey, it's Nathan, and today I wanted to go ahead and talk about this stuff, which is just like a lot of different things from voting theory. In particular, uh, the point of this video is to talk about one particular voting system that does not fit the conditions of errors and possibility theorem and does stuff that errors and possibility theorem says cannot happen for ranked voting systems. So if you've watched any other voting theory content on YouTube, you have probably heard about arrows and possibility theorem or arrows paradox. It's not really a paradox though. It's just a theorem that says something about some formalization of what it means for a voting system to be fair when there are more than three candidates and votes are cast by ranking candidates in a certain order. In particular, the theorem states that there does not exist a ranked order voting system that elects a candidate from a set of three or more candidates that can satisfy the properties that, one, it's weak Pareto, which just means that if every voter strictly prefers candidate A to candidate B, then the collective group will strictly prefer candidate A to candidate B. Two, independence of irrelevant alternatives. So if every voter's preferences between A and B remains unchanged, then the collective group's preference between A and B will remain unchanged, even if voters' preferences between other pairs of candidates change. And then lastly, three, it's non-dictatorial or non-dictatorship. So no single voter possesses the power to always determine the group's preferences. So these three properties are just some mathematical formalizations of properties that have in the past been deemed as fairness criteria or things that we want a particular voting system to have to say that a given election was fair in accounting for the preferences of all of the voters. Usually the case of errors and possibility theorem that is talked about the most, at least on the internet here of what I've seen, is people focus in on when you force the weak Pareto property and you force the independence of relevant alternatives property, and then you go ahead and generate a dictator from all of that information. I am not going to focus on those types of examples. Instead, I want to go ahead and introduce a different type of voting system and show that you can have voting systems that are weak Pareto, independent of relevant alternatives, and non-dictatorial, and actually prove that one of them is all three of those things. To do that, I do have to hang out with the uh, weak Pareto and independent or irrelevant alternatives example really quickly because uh, I want to talk about another property of or another fairness property that's called uh, anonymity. And so anonymity is something that's strongly related to dictatorships because if you have one, you usually don't have the other one. Uh, in particular, if you are dictatorial, that means that you are not anonymous. And if you are anonymous, that means that you are non-dictatorial uh, by the contrapositive. So how does anonymity work? Well, anonymity is the property that if all of your voters go ahead and vote and you run the election with just the votes attached to their voter as usual, then that would be the same as having the voters vote, shuffling all of the ballots, handing them back to the voters, and then having the voters cast those permuted votes. That is, every voter's vote counts the same amount. So in a dictatorial system, you always have a dictator voter. So whenever you go ahead and have people fill out their ballots, whichever ballot the dictator turns in is what determines all of the preferences of your group. And so that's an issue for anonymity because when you permute ballots, if someone disagrees with the dictator and then the dictator gets the ballot of the voter that disagreed with them, then the election result will change because then the dictator cast a ballot with different preferences than before and therefore the result will be different. So if you have a dictator, then the dictator's ballot always determines the winner and therefore the dictatorial system is not anonymous or does not have anonymity. While if you have anonymity, then you must be non-dictatorial by the contrapositive. This statement is going to be important later on because it's... Ten, at least for what I'm going to do or how I think about this stuff, it's easier for me to prove something is anonymous than to prove something does not have a dictator. So the fact that Arrows and Possibility Theorem is true leads a lot of people to proclaim that all voting systems are unfair. And often when you're in introductory courses that are about like surveys of math, it's often stated that like no voting system is fair and it arrows and possibility theorem is used to back up that claim. That's 
not entirely true, because there are other types of voting systems that are not based on ranking. One such example of a class of voting systems that work differently is that of score voting systems. So in score votes, there is a fundamental difference between how votes are made. So in a ranked voting system, the voter just goes ahead and lists all of the candidates in a strict order of their preferences. While in a score voting system, a voter gives a value of their choice from a set defined within some bounded range to each candidate based on how okay they are with that particular candidate winning. Here, there's a little bit of nuance because there do exist ranked voting systems that use scores in order to determine their winners. Methods like the board account method, for example, use the ranking to determine a score for a candidate associated with a ballot, and then use those scores to figure out who has the highest score and say who wins. Those are still examples of ranked voting systems because the rank implies the score and the score implies the rank for each ballot. So we're not thinking about those types of systems. We're thinking about systems where your voter could assign all of the candidates to have the highest score value possible if they were totally okay with everyone doing that job. So that's the style of thing that we're thinking about. So the question then is, well, how do score voting systems differ from ranked voting systems? Is there really any difference? And the answer is, yes, there is. And that's because you can have score voting systems that are weak Pareto independent of irrelevant alternatives and are non-dictatorial all simultaneously. One of the most accessible examples of this is that of the simple approval voting system. So the caveat here is actually that approval voting is its own class of voting systems if you define it in the right way. There are uh, a few different formulations. I've gone ahead and put a paper in the description down below that talks about two of those formalizations of approval voting as a class of voting systems. But in this video, when I say approval voting, I'm thinking about the one simple approval voting system that is just a voter goes ahead and gives a one to a candidate if they approve of that candidate and a zero to that candidate if they do not approve of that candidate. So in this simple approval voting system where every voter goes ahead and assigns a one to a candidate if they approve of them or a zero to them if they do not approve of them, a candidate's vote count is then just the number of voters that went ahead and approved said candidate. So as I've mentioned before, this is going to be an example of a voting system that is in fact weak Pareto, independent of irrelevant alternatives, and non-dictatorial. So first, for the weak Pareto property, we need to show that if every voter strictly prefers A to B, then the collective group will go ahead and prefer A to B. So in the simple approval voting system, if everyone strictly prefers A to B, then every voter assigned a 1 to A and a 0 to B. So A's vote count would be N for the number of voters, and B's vote count would be 0. So the collective would prefer A to B as desired. For independence of relevant alternatives, we need to show and apologies for the gobbledygook that's about to come out of my face while I state this. If each voter's preferences between candidate A and candidate B remains unchanged between two elections, then the overall preferences will remain the same. That is, for every A and B that are candidates, if voter I votes in one election that A is strictly preferred or indifferent to B, if and only if that same voter votes in the next election that A is strictly preferred to or indifferent to B, and vice versa, then A will be strictly preferred or indifferent to B overall in the first election if and only if A will be strictly preferred or indifferent to B overall in the next election, or vice versa. Again, it's kind of a mess to say it out loud. So go ahead and consider two elections in which preferences between A and B do not change amongst the voters. Without loss of generality, assume that A is strictly preferred or indifferent to B overall in the first election. Then the number of approvals of A is greater than or equal to the number of approvals of B. If the preferences between other candidates are changed, it does not affect the number of approvals A receives or the number of approvals that B receives. And thus in the second election, A will be strictly preferred to or indifferent to B overall. And so this approval method is 
independent of irrelevant alternatives. On the board, I did a little bit more strict inequality work as well, so you can see how you get some of those inequalities. And lastly, for non-dictatorial, we can go ahead and show anonymity, which will go ahead and imply non-dictatorial. So we need to show that overall preferences amongst candidates do not change when the ballots are permuted between the voters before they are turned in. So for a given arbitrary candidate A, the vote count for A corresponds to exactly how many approvals that A received. Any permutation of the ballots will still have the same total number of approvals present for candidate A. And thus the overall preference for A remains unchanged after the ballots are shuffled amongst the voters. But since candidate A was arbitrary, this holds for all candidates in the election. So all candidates will receive the same score between the two elections. So the approval voting method has anonymity and thus is non-dictatorial. So the punchline here is that there do exist voting systems that live outside of the context of Arrow's impossibility theorem. In particular, there are voting systems out there that are weak Pareto, independent of relevant alternatives, and non-dictatorial simultaneously. There are observable problems with score ballots, though, and one of those is the N winner problem, or the multiple winner problem. So there are several ways to remediate this. One such way is to use a random ordering to determine a tiebreaker, which may introduce some ordering stuff back into the voting system. So to avoid that, another example of one way you could fix this is with what's called a coin flip runoff election. So in a coin flip runoff election, you generate these new coin flip ballots that are determined by K coins for the K winners that are present in the election, and then everyone else on the ballot who has already lost just gets a zero. And so in each stage of the coin flip runoff, you go ahead and flip all K coins and see which ones of them are heads. If they're heads, then that counts as an approval for that candidate. If they're tails, that counts as a disapproval for that candidate. And you keep flipping the coins until there is one person left over that has the most approvals based on the electorate's ballots and the coin flip runoff ballots. That's sort of just an idea that I was thinking about when I thought about doing this video. Um, you could do a ton of different other things to determine a tiebreaker if you want a tiebreaker, or you could do like the whole oligarchy thing where you just have your small group of people that won do the thing that they were voted to do. But yeah, that's essentially like all I wanted to talk about today. I've been crazy busy. Uh, so it's a miracle that I have gotten this together and put it on the internet and I am better for it. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to talk about some voting theory stuff that I had been thinking about earlier in the summer. Uh, and yeah, so there's that. Um, if you are interested in more math stuff, I've got more math stuff all on my channel. Um, so there's that. As always, I am Nathan. This one, uh, well, th th this was chalk, right? That's, that's how that goes. I am Nathan. This is chalk. And I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.